Good morning, good evening, wherever this um, webcast may find you. Uh, my name is Shihoko Goto. I am the Deputy Director for Geoeconomics with the Asia, uh, with the Wilson Center's Asia program. And it's my great delight to be able to welcome you here today. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the Wilson Center, um, it was established in 1968 as an act of Congress. It is a think tank that is dedicated to uh, foreign policy analysis. And the Asia program focuses on US interests in the Indo-Pacific region. Of course, Asia is the world's most populous and most dynamic region. And that has been both a blessing and a curse. The pandemic over the last year has made clear some of the weaknesses and vulnerabilities that uh, those in densely populated areas can face, especially when it comes to dealing with governance issues, uh, economic challenges, and, and social concerns in, uh, in, in Asia and beyond. Um, the pandemic has also led us to rethink on where and how we live and function, and our expectations and dreams for cities have evolved as well. Reassessing and reimagining the future of urban areas is critical for Asia's future economic success, social stability, and also environmental sustainability. And I am excited to be able to uh, be joined by a team from the Asian Development Bank that has recently released a publication entitled Creating Livable Asian Cities, focusing on smart and sustainable growth of cities. Uh, but before I turn it over to Robert Guild, Chief Sector Officer of Knowledge Management and Sustainable Development um, at the ADB and one of the editors of Creating Livable Cities together with Ben Bang Susantano, the VP of Knowledge Management and Sustainable Development at uh, the bank. Um, I would like to point out that this is a live webcast and a recording of this discussion will be uploaded onto the Wilson Center's website. Uh, we will be taking questions live as well. You can email us at asia at wilsoncenter.org. Again, that's asia at wilsoncenter.org, or you can tweet us at Asia, at Asia Program. Uh, so with that, uh, Robert. Thank you very much, Shihoko, and um, good day to everybody. Welcome from the Asian Development Bank. Um, it has been my great pleasure to be the editor of this publication, but even more so to have worked with all of the authors and the presenters here tonight. This has been truly a 180B effort, and a lot of people have been involved. Uh, I think my mailing list was uh, something like uh, 40 plus people every time we dealt with this. So thank you for joining us today. I thank the Wilson Center and uh, Shihoko for hosting the event today. And I particularly convey my gratitude to the many experts within and outside ADB who made this book possible. Asia's future is urban. Asian cities are hubs of economic and social opportunity for people, for business, and for many other things. And they are booming. However, the growing urbanization we see does not neatly translate into increased opportunities for residential populations. As Asian cities grow, the urgency to address critical development issues becomes ever greater. These issues include inadequate spatial and economic planning, urban infrastructure deficits, significant air and water pollution, the growing risks from climate change, and a lack of affordable housing. On top of all of that, the COVID-19 pandemic has underscored just how unequal urban services have become, severely affecting access by the poor and vulnerable. So this book addresses multiple challenges facing Asian cities and tackles the fundamental question, how do we make our cities more livable? The cross-cutting theme that has emerged from the many chapters in this book is the importance of sharing knowledge solutions promoting technological and digital enhancements and improving practices in urban governance. Accordingly, this book highlights five key priorities, smart and inclusive planning, sustainable energy, sustainable transport, innovative finance, and resilience and rejuvenation. 
and each of these priorities and their features will be discussed by my colleagues to follow on. Given what we're all been dealing with for the last year and a half, this book carries even greater meaning as it was conceived, prepared, and launched in the middle of a pandemic. We seek out better ways to respond through urban solutions and from new perspectives. I'm sure everyone knows that every crisis provides an opportunity to make bold choices that can help us leapfrog to a more resilient, inclusive, and sustainable path for Asian cities. So I hope that policymakers, urban leaders, and stakeholders will grasp some of these solutions and insights discussed in the publication to build back better. Let me reiterate ADB's commitment to support the creation of more livable Asian cities. We know there's no one size fits all approach as each city evolves within its own unique contest. And so we must adopt tailored approaches to build innovative, evidence-based and integrated solutions. I know that working together, we can create cities that are green, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable. In short, more livable. And at the ADB, we look forward to working with all stakeholders to achieve that goal. Thank you. And over to Jingmen, I think. And good evening, good morning to everybody from uh, Manila, Philippines. I am Jingming Huang. I'm the Director of Urban Development and Water Division in Pacific Department of Asian Demand Bank. I'm so pleased to present the chapter one of the book, Smart and Inclusive City Planning. It is extremely meaningful in this pandemic time because the city planning is a fundamental driver to build our cities back and better towards livable cities. Can I have the slides, please? Thank you very much. Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, I'm going to talk about this uh, smart and inclusive city planning. Uh, this chapter has five articles uh, propelled by 14 authors listed here. I will present them in three slides. Smart city planning, inclusive city planning, and how we can achieve that. Next slide, please. First, smart city planning. When we talk about the smart city, what does it mean? Why it is so important to us? To respond, this article revealed 153 smart city strategies along within 29 international models. Based on that, it recommends an analytical framework and guidance for smart city planning covering their policy, technology, capacity building, and financing perspectives, as indicated in the right side of this slide here. By reading this article, you will learn how to use the framework to develop your own smart city planning. The prevention of pandemic can be included in the smart health and the smart disaster risk management here. Next slide, please. Inclusive uh, city planning comes from two articles, the affordable housing and the gender inclusive planning. Can you imagine how many urban residents in Asia live in adequate housing conditions? It is a very tough question. Even in Manila, where ADB headquarters is located, the Article 1B answered it based on 211 cities in 27 ADB member economies. Reading the article, you will know which cities should reform their housing policy and planning, covering informal settlements and the rental market to improve the housing affordability and adequacy. Women's participation in governance and decision-making really creates more inclusiveness and make, makes life happier. The Article 1D proposes a PAMS framework as a tool for problem identification and analysis, as indicated in the right side here. Please follow the framework and do your own exercise. It's fun. Next slide, please. 
You may ask how to achieve that. Smart and inclusive livable city planning should be facilitated by sound approaches. The Article 1D provides current trends in the technology and how it is applied in developing countries. You would see why cities should shift from our very traditional data gathering and analysis to real-time data generation, remote monitoring, and also use of satellite image, AI, and also open data. Use Earth observation technology as an example. You can see here, figures on the right up corner show the natural city observed with nighttime lights against the city planning in dashed line. In 1992 and 2016, separately for Calcutta in India and Madan City in Indonesia. Understanding the difference of these two can help the future city planning to be in line with the natural expansion and save the resource and also effort. Last but not the least, the city cluster governance. Despite rapid urbanization in Asia, you may notice many cities still lose their population and are shrinking. Small and medium cities have better chances to grow if they are integrated into city clusters with larger cities. City clusters would provide supporting network to each other and promote economic corridors. The map in the left side here in this slide shows the city clusters with population above 10 million in ADB member economies in the year 2016. What intervention we can do to promote resilience and bound in city clusters is discussed in the Article 1E. This will help to address the climate change and better respond to pandemic such as COVID-19. ADB worked on several city clusters, including the Yangtze River Delta area in China and the Indian economy corridors development. I would stop here. Please do visit the chapter and discover more details. Look forward to following presenters about different perspectives of livable cities. Thank you. Could we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. My name is Jamie Leather, and I'm the chief of the transport sector at the Asian Development Bank. And I want to try and, we've seen this five sections in, in the transport part of the publication, and I hope I can do justice to my co-authors who are listed here. I will try and lift some snippets of information from each of the five components discussed here. Next slide, please. Transport has always played an interwoven role within urban form. Right from the beginning, the, the city structures were somewhat governed by the, the distance people could walk. And as technologies came on, we saw them shift the, the increased distances along linear transport routes, forging the, the city centers. But what we're showing on the left-hand side is really two different types of transport systems and how they have structured the urban form. Down one side, we see the, the growth of private mobility, and on the other side, transit systems and public transport or non-motorized. And not, nothing is static. Cities move between the two as and when vehicle ownership or vehicle use changes. And you can see in the middle what we've termed a Bangkok syndrome, which was severe congestion around 20, 20 years ago, the infamous congestion that we found in around Bangkok. I would stress to, to my Thai colleagues and the, and the city of Bangkok that they may have made great uh, progress in trying to reverse some of that traffic congestion and have been heavily investing in their transport systems and traffic control measures as well. So they are now moving back to a, to a more transit orientated system. 
And on the right hand side, these are some uh, estimates of transport systems and passenger demands by different modes. At the top, the orange shows the private modes, motorcycles or private vehicles, four wheel vehicles. And at the bottom, non motorized transport, walking and cycling, and public transport system. Very crudely, and it is a rule of thumb, if you look at around 70%. Of, of trips made by non-motorized transport and public transport and 30% by private modes, you would have a fairly sustainable transport system. And some of the cities in Asia that are always heralded as great examples, Singapore, Seoul, Tokyo, they all have around 70% of their trips are non-motorized or on public transport. And you will see across many of the developing uh, countries their cities also have around 70%, but this is more through captive use uh, and the lack of access to private mobility. So one key issue that we're facing within Asian cities is to maintain the current balance in terms of use of non-motorized transport and public transport and stop that shift into private forms of transport usually started with motorbikes and we see many countries in South and Southeast Asia have started to see a boom in the use, uh, purchase and use of motorcycles, but we want to try and arrest that and make sure that the focus is on transit orientated cities. Next slide please. Another important aspect is e-mobility. I'm very much of the opinion that the glass is half full when it comes to e-mobility. We are at a tipping point um, and it's no longer as when it will happen, it's just how soon. The cost differential is, is, is at a point now where different modes of transport are becoming much more viable, both in terms of the purchase price, but also in terms of the operations. And I would also stress that we believe that Asian is leading in many aspects of e-mobility and its uptake. And some figures there, we're showing that around a third of the private vehicles, four wheel family cars are in the Asian region. But perhaps much more importantly is the, is the sheer number, absolute terms in terms of two and three wheelers, electric two and three wheelers in the region. 230 million, that's uh, five, six years ago, and it's growing rapidly. So the number of two and three electric two and three wheelers is significantly higher than the number of four wheel or family vehicles. Um, so we're seeing that there is a, just in, the, in terms of the, the numbers, a huge use already of e-mobility. And the final figure there is showing that 99% of the world's electric buses were in the People's Republic of China in 2018. This is no longer a pilot. Um, some cities are 100% e-bus fleet. So it is uh, a transition that is happening. It's happening very rapidly and it's happening in certain areas, the two, three wheelers, urban areas, um, delivery, small delivery vehicles, and buses as well. We've, we've also looked at the uh, environmental impact, obviously how that power is generated. And at the bottom there, we're showing those countries that have more renewable uh, mix within their power generation. And what, at what level in terms of the power uh, factor or the grid factor would make it beneficial to switch to the e-mobility options. Next slide, please. Another area that it, it, perhaps Asia has fallen behind many of the developing parts of the world, developed parts of the world, sorry, is in the use of technology and intelligent transport systems. But these can have many different roles. And on the side, we see how we can improve or utilize this technology and the uptake to improve safety, efficiency of the transport systems, but how the network works together. And on the right hand side, just picking one or two of these items, I think big data and the use of that and integrating that within transport system management, information systems for the passengers or the users will can, uh, transform how people make the choices on how they will move or where they will go. Um, and it covers all the other components as well. And the real benefit of intelligence transport systems is when all of these components are factored in together. So it's giving the traffic control system, it's giving the public transport information system, parking information system, 
And perhaps the most important part of this will when we be looking at movements and how that's happened, such as the electronic road pricing system in Singapore, where they'll have almost real time information on where each vehicle is traveling throughout the day. Next slide, please. Another area that I think has got huge potential in terms of revolutionizing how transport is thought about, and here I go back to putting the person first. So with mobility as a service is really how people should travel around a city, not how we should build railways or build bus routes or build roads. It's about putting the person first. So what information does the, do the people need and to be able to access and move around a city? And we can see on the right-hand side that this covers all areas from public to private, collective or individual use as well. And bringing all of these components we, in terms of urban access, urban mobility, we can integrate these, but very much putting the person first rather than the infrastructure or the other components. Next slide, please. The final point I wanted to raise in terms of uh, urban transport is road safety. Now, the region is responsible for about 60% of global fertilities, sorry, fatalities on the road. Um, and beyond that, a significant number of serious injuries. We're seeing increasingly this is going into younger age groups. The, the prime cause of death now, according to WHO, is for those in the age group of 15 to 40, is from road crashes. And to address this, it's not just about the infrastructure, it's about a whole safe system. We must look at the management, the safer roads, safer vehicles, safer road users, post-crash care, and, and looking at the various components here. And the actions, we know what works. Um, it's reducing speed, it's wearing seatbelt, it's child restraints. And in this part of the world, motorbike helmets is very important alcohol and drug, and you, as well as the infrastructure. So within these cities, where they must be driven by transit system. It was mentioned by Shihuko at the beginning, the densities. These Asian cities, very large, very dense, must be served by a transport system that can move the, the most number of people in the limited space available, which is a transit system. But with that, we need to ensure that we're not creating too much emissions, be they local or global. We want to make sure the roads are safe and we want to make sure that they're accessible for all. And that includes the information, the data um, that we can utilize for there as well as the affordability, uh, particularly in the poorer countries and making sure that no one is left behind within urban access and urban mobility. I think that's all from me. If you go to the next slide, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I am uh, Priyanta Vijayatunga, uh, the director of the South Asia Energy Division of the uh, Asian Development Bank. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. Within the next few minutes, I am taking you through a brief description, description of the three energy related chapters. As the cities develop from rapid urbanization across developing countries, the demand for energy increases. Cities account for about two thirds of the world's energy consumption, contributing to about 70% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. Sustainable urban energy systems are a key uh, enablers for making cities more livable. This section talks about uh, the place and the role of energy in creating livable cities, both in terms of meeting its needs and taking, making it sustainable. This consists of three chapters, sustainable energy solutions, the first chapter, and then microgrid application in urban development. The second and the last but not least is waste, waste to energy and circular economy. Next slide, please. This figure shows the elements of a sustainable energy system, urban energy system. It essentially summarizes this chapter, shows not just the components, but what it takes to achieve uh, what we need. 
the systems approach and the cross sectoral implications. This article deals with uh, the following questions. What are the sustainable energy solutions for cities to be livable and are they available? How can these solutions be effectively applied? What are the roles played by technology, policy and approaches when taking these solutions forward? The article explores six areas where city, national and regional governments can focus to reduce emissions. Urban energy systems, buildings, transport and urban planning, green infrastructure, sustainable land use and water management. The case studies demonstrate that a wide range of technological options are already available for the transition to clean and low carbon urban energy systems. The cost of these options are continuously decreasing and they are improving in capability. Thus, there is a compelling case for cities to make progress now and adjust their strategies as new approaches and technologies become viable. The potential of a single energy solution can be optimized when it is implemented as a part of an integrated system. Such integrated urban energy systems may also require improved sector governance and institutions. Next slide, please. This graphic shows a conceptual design of an urban microgrid and its key components. The key features tackled in this particular article are, what, are the, uh, what is the role of microgrids in a sustainable energy system? How does a microgrid work? What are the challenges in developing microgrids and how can these be overcome? This chapter introduces the use of urban microgrids in Asia for greater urban energy flexibility, efficiency, and resilience. The article describes various types of microgrids and their typical design and operating modes. The normal operating mode is enabled when a microgrid is connected to the main grid. But when a power interruption or disturbance on the main grid takes place, the microgrid will be disconnected and shift, shifted to an isolated mode. Whether planned or unplanned, the disconnection will not affect the microgrid operation. There are a few challenges to scaling up my uh, implementation of these microgrids, including their typical customized nature, limited financing modes, regulatory barriers, no standard interconnection protocols, and operational mismatches. These can be mitigated with appropriate governance approaches, such as specific urban energy policies and so on. Microgrids can then play a substantial role in future with decarbonization, digitization, digitalization, and decentralization as key attributes. Next slide, please. The graphic in here illustrates circular economy and the importance of a framework in approaching waste and waste management. This article attempts to address three key questions in waste management. What is circular economy and what does it imply for waste waste to energy and waste management. How can the urban sector effectively manage waste? What solutions are available? How can challenges in creating a circular economy is waste management be overcome? This article makes a case for greater efforts to develop the circular economy. Waste to energy initiatives are a one uh, component in a cycle leading to improved urban sustainability. Asian cities are often a struggle to plan and manage waste, and Asian cities are only able to collect and properly dis dispose less than half of urban solid waste, making recycling and energy generation even more challenging. The article explains solutions and actions that can be considered to improve waste management outcomes, including sustainable consumption and production and development and implementation of necessary policies, laws, and regulations. There are seven approaches all, uh, all described in detail within in the chapter. While there are many challenges to developing a circular economy, there can be this can be overcome through various interventions from something as simple as awareness creation and more challenging like fiscal policy support. As an alternative to traditional economy, a circular economy can definitely be a more sustainable solution in the longer term. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Isaka Kimura. 
I'm very happy to be here presenting section four financial innovation. COVID-19 changed the financial landscape. Public debt in emerging market has surged to the level not seen in 15 years. Against this backdrop, section four starts with financial sustainability of Asian cities, then deep dives into financial solutions for two most important sectors, housing and transport. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Let me start with key challenges in municipal finance management in developing countries in Asia. City government experienced considerable constraint in raising local revenue. For example, local tax revenue have been limited. This incentive caused by intergovernmental transfer and regulation from central government are main reasons. Also, we observe political pressure to keep water tariff and other user charges low. Cost of infrastructure operation and maintenance tend to be underestimated. On the expenditure management, top concern include weak estimation, quality over quantity in spending. How can we turn these challenges into opportunities? Our book will show you comprehensive analysis and some recommendations. Next slide, please. Now let's talk about finance. We categorize options into on-source revenue, intergovernmental transfers, borrowing, and new solutions. Developing countries in Asia would need 1.7 trillion US dollar annually to meet the sustainable development goals. City count for 70% and need a broad range of solutions, including private sectors to meet the goals. With relying more on private sector, the government can free up significant amount of fund to its critical expenditure, such as pandemic response. The chapter discuss how to catalyze the new option such as city level public private partnership, municipal bond, development fund, pooled financing, and also how to utilize infrastructure as an asset class to attract institutional investors. Next slide, please. Here are some examples of project finance with those new options. Manila light rail transit extension, PPP in Jakarta and 16 cities to improve solid waste management. Calcutta housing project for low and medium income households through a cross subsidy approach. Next slide, please. The second chapter is urban housing bond market development. Living space is most essential in these trying times. Housing finance include both the finance for housing supply as well as the mortgage market for consumer to borrow. A housing bond can bring fundamental changes to structure housing finance. Next slide, please. Uh, this chapter share with you a diverse selection of examples from United States, Europe, and Asia including Republic of Korea, Singapore, Thailand, Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, and People's Republic of China. Some countries have achieved goals through housing agency bond rather than expansion of mortgage backed security. We continue to support a wide range of unique way to each country to develop housing bond market in Asia. Next slide, please. The last chapter is to enhance infrastructure investments through value capture. We all know transit infrastructure creates value uplift, but key question is how to capture such value and recycle that back into infrastructure investment. Next slide, please. The chapter share case study of urban transit and intercity pathway. Uh, here's a preview of positive and negative externality of public transportation. 
for developing countries, the premium is significant. Next slide, please. Time dimension is very important. And this slide is based on Manila MRT3 for 25 years. First announcement of project increased the demand by speculators and property investors. Second, project construction representing higher value and also higher level of confidence. And the third, completion and ready for occupancy. The final question I'd like to highlight is how we can make system to bring those who benefit from positive spillover in contributing to infrastructure investment for the future. Let me stop here. I hope you will enjoy the journey to find five mechanisms to address this question in our book. Thank you so much again, and over to you, Neta. Thank you, Hisaka. Um, well, don't they say save the best for last? Uh, my name is Nita Pokhril. I'm the chief of water sector group in the Asian Development Bank. And I'll be briefly talking today about the chapter on resilience and rejuvenation, which has three articles, as you see here, by nine authors. And it is my privilege to be here to present the excellent work. Next slide, please. Thank you. As most of us here know, um, nature-based solution, this is the first article, um, is increasingly recognized as an effective resilience uh, solution. Um, though what we see here in Asia, it, its implementation is still very limited. Um, and we practitioners repeatedly hear from our clients, uh, from our colleagues, questions like how reliable is nature-based solution in, in our context in developing Asia? And what would be the easiest entry points? How do we institutionalize this approach? So the first article of this chapter tackles precisely these questions and discusses strategies to integrate nature-based solutions in our context in developing Asian cities. The chapter explores uh, practical and evidence-based nature-based solutions, drawing from some of the ADB projects that are implementing these approaches in the field, in PRC, in Philippines, in Indonesia. And it also looks at how we can do this at various geographic scales and through relevant concept and cases such as green infrastructure, Spawn City, water sensitive urban design and various hybrid approaches. You will see it at a very large scale in PRC to much smaller scales, community scales, informal settlements in the context that it has been used. Finally, the article suggests also that combining natural assets with the city's total asset management system is a practical way forward or almost an entry point for a city to integrate nature-based solutions to build its resilience. Next slide, please. Thank you. And cities in our region do face a greater share of natural hazards than any other global reasons. So to effectively cope with increasingly complex disaster events, our cities need to adopt a risk-based approach and an integrated risk management system. So the second article of this chapter explains how we build such a systematic approach precisely uh, and the integrated system by providing lots of concrete examples and project cases in developing Asia and elsewhere. It articulates step-by-step step the risk-informed decisions which enable cities to quantify the risks and compare the economic costs with investments required to manage future risks. This article also presents a range of priority measures to rehabilitate and reconstruct what we call build back better. This seems to be uh, something that all of us are hearing very repeatedly and we should be, and discusses various disaster risk financing instruments, including insurance. This article also covers how to deal with inherent uncertainty by using emergency technologies such as earth observation. Some of my colleagues, uh, Jingming, when she started, already talked about this and gave concrete examples. Big data, artificial intelligence, 
which are again presented uh, elsewhere also in, in this book, uh, mostly in chapter one. Next slide, please. Thank you. The last article uh, talks about the post-pandemic challenges. We can't say um, we are at post-pandemic because some of us are still living in, in the third phase of the pandemic. So these three uh, ways, response, recovery, and rejuvenation. And it is not just COVID-19 that we're talking about. For centuries, various pandemics have influenced urban developments. Um, and Robert also mentioned that when he discussed, however, this COVID-19 pandemic has caused and is continuing to cause an unprecedented impact on urban development and is again presenting numerous lessons for us to move forward as we build back better through these various um, phases of response, recovery and rejuvenation. So this article has therefore been prepared based on these lessons and it sets out a framework for each of these phases of response recovery and rejuvenation in the four sectors that you see here on the slide, urban development, transport, water and energy. And we call them new normals. So these are prepared as the new normal guidance note by ADB and by various sector colleagues. My sector for water sector group, we conducted a comprehensive survey in the middle of the pandemic in, in May 2020. And we got a lot of response from the different type of water partners that we work with, utilities, irrigation service providers, uh, government entities, and these are based on the real feedback from the survey results. So the key principles of this framework include continued safe operation of essential services with particular attention to the vulnerable and mainstreaming these new normal measures into the operating procedures as we move forward. The framework also aims to support the cities to effectively respond, not only in this immediate term, but also to remain steadfast in planning for a green and resilient recovery for the medium to long term through investments in more resilient systems, decentralized solutions, and as I already mentioned, the greener and nature-based solutions, and also in digitalization and innovative technologies. And as many of our colleagues mentioned, particularly Robert, when he started the floor, every crisis can serve as an opportunity. And this crisis really will present a lot of opportunities for our cities to become livable. So let me finish my brief presentation here by talking about that hope and that opportunity to leapfrog into a more resilient, a more inclusive, a more prosperous and sustainable future for our cities. Thank you very much. Back to you. Great. Uh, well, Nita, thank you so much. Um, thank you all very much for that very uh, rich and thought provoking uh, analysis. We, you've covered, you've given us a little taste of the book that is so comprehensive and very timely as well. Uh, before I ask our discussant to join us, let me remind our viewers that we are taking questions. You can email us. Um, the email address is asia at wilsoncenter.org. Again, that's asia at wilsoncenter.org. Uh, or you can tweet us um, at Asia Program. Um, and with that, let me ask um, Uwe Brandis, who is a professor of the practice and faculty director of the Urban and Regional Planning Program. And he is also the faculty director of the Georgetown Global Cities Initiative. Um, Uwe has many, many um, accomplishments, but I do want to point out that he is um, not just an academic, he is also a very active practitioner who has prepared uh, development plans in New York City um, and across the United States um, and Europe, as well as in China and South Korea as well. So with that, Uwe, we look forward to your comments and feedback on the presentations given. Thank you so much, Shihoko. Uh, and thank you to everyone at the Wilson Center for allowing me to be with you here today. I'd like to start off with 
a huge congratulations to the entire team at the Asia Development Bank for producing this publication. Uh, this publication, I believe, um, is seminal. Uh, it is in the tradition of other seminal uh, research documents <clears throat> that the Asia Development Bank has produced. And I would like to just uh, maybe to start off with build on this idea that we are at an important moment in time. Uh, about 10 years ago now, I think everyone will remember that we globally reached that mark where more than half of people uh, on earth were living in cities. <clears throat> and so uh, it comes as no surprise that uh, the issues of urbanism and urbanism in Asia in particular um, are front and center as uh, an important subject to be discussing and exploring and documenting. Um, and we are at this moment where uh, we are only 30 years out <clears throat> from uh, a major global milestone of 2050, uh, where we know we have to transform um, uh, societies and cities uh, into more sustainable systems. And so this, this publication could not come at a better time. And I'd like to congratulate all of, all of the authors. The rise of urban development practices in Asia <clears throat> and uh, East Asia in particular are so significant globally uh, because this region is conducting bold, bold innovations and experiments um, that are really teaching the rest of the world um, how to think big, how to um, uh, serve populations in new ways. And um, I think that this publication could have just been called Creating Asian Cities, and that would have been, you know, uh, significant in and of itself. Uh, but I'm so happy and delighted that the Asia Development Bank chose to title this pub publication Creating Livable Asian Cities. Uh, this is a key, key change. And while it may seem um, uh, a, a, a just a, a casual or kind of a, a, a normal move on behalf of the authors, in terms of the larger uh, community of urban planners, urban developers in Asia and around the world, including the term livable is key to thinking about innovation and thinking about future practices in shaping the built environment. Because what it does is it introduces the person um, into the conversation and transcends <clears throat> an emphasis only on systems and material outputs uh, to really introduce the human experience, um, the, the daily choices that people need to make in order to live productive lives in cities. And it puts that um, uh, on the center stage of, of the conversation. And from my perspective, this human-centered design idea uh, leads to uh, conversations that we have always had, but need to have more of uh, around urban design, community design, the specific attributes of individual places uh, within cities and within regions, and even extending into <clears throat> uh, ideas such as placemaking and creating meaningf meaningful places for people to live um, within cities. This extends to issues of historic preservation, cultural preservation, <clears throat> and, um, and the manner in which uh, cities uh, really are responsive to the communities who live there. Um, at the same time, I think this publication is totally appropriate in being a call to action <clears throat> to uh, think about um, as, as we just heard, uh, the concepts of resiliency in a, in a much uh, more explicit uh, manner. Um, 
to think about the process of decarbonization of cities, um, not as just a, another thing that we need to do, uh, but really as a bold opportunity uh, to, to rethink how uh, people live in cities and how urban systems support uh, people's needs. And um, I want to <clears throat> end um, with two observations that I think are critically important. Um, one um, which is really around housing and we heard uh, an ex excellent presentation around housing finance. <clears throat> um, but I think the pandemic is forcing us uh, around the world um, to think about the role of housing and its relationship to work, uh, its relationship to productive economies um, and calling into question <clears throat> um, the stubborn um, frameworks, modernist frameworks of separating housing away from uh, other uh, urban activities and thinking more boldly around <clears throat> integrated mixed use urban districts. Um, this is something that I think is critically important to uh, explicitly discuss. And then finally, <clears throat> um, you know, we can look at um, Asian cities uh, and really see the extraordinary impact that intentional urban policies, urban development policies can have in poverty reduction. Uh, and there are so many excellent examples across uh, Asia um, with respect to, to that. <clears throat> but as we think about social capital uh, moving forward over these next 30 years in Asian cities, um, I don't think that we can um, avoid talking about the very powerful forces associated with informality and the manner in which <clears throat> informality needs to weave its way in to the conversation associated with formal formalized urban systems. Um, uh, I know that's a very big topic, but um, it, it is important, I think, to continue to keep that on the table as we discuss how formal investments, and in some cases, very large systemic changes um, uh, to cities um, are, are proposed, um, designed, and, and implemented. And with that, uh, I'd just like to, again, congratulate uh, the entire team at the Asia Development Bank. Uh, I'm certain this is going to be a very important publication for many years to come and uh, equally for stakeholders across Asia uh, and around the world. So thank you very much. Back to you, Shihoko. Great. Uh, thanks very much, Uwe. And as someone who is actually telecommuting right now, I couldn't agree more about the power of informality. And we really, all of us um, have really had to reconsider how we live, where we live. And again, this book has been a thought provoking and much needed um, guide call to action uh, to, to reconsider what we think are normal and, and norms and uh, talk about where we go from here in, in a sustainable way. Um, again, I would like to rem remind our viewers that we are taking questions. Uh, you can tweet us at Asia Program or you can email us um, at, uh, at uh, asia, asia at wilsoncenter.org. We've already received a few questions from participants, but uh, I would like to perhaps highlight uh, two of them. Um, one um, from Mark Ginsburg, who says, how do you plan to measure progress of the cities towards their sustainability goals? Would you be willing to use a tool like LEAD for cities to help design uh, measure and um, uh, evaluate the success of, of uh, development. And um, in a similar vein, Chris Greer asks, can sharing of ideas and best practices with cities and communities worldwide enhance progress? And how could that sharing be achieved? Uh, these are fairly open-ended questions. So I, I leave it to any of you um, if you have any uh, thoughts about. Uh, best practices and who's leading the way in doing this right? Uh, 
Okay, um, Mark, that's a great question, and and, and thank you very much. Um, I, I really wish we had the chief of our urban group here, who led the development of our uh, urban strategy. But let, let me preface what I have to say with a, a bit of background uh, on, on measuring progress. So uh, two years ago, ADB developed its uh, strategy 2030, which has seven operational priorities. And operational priority four is making cities more livable. Now in, in that, um, document, which you can find on adb.org, shameless advertisement here. Um, there are what we call um, pillars, or um, in normal language, let's call them objectives, urban development objectives. And, and these pillars have tracking indicators, and it's all set out. And off the top of my head, I don't remember all of them, but I can tell you that they've all been baked into ADB's corporate results framework. And we have a very um, robust, a very systematic way of tracking progress uh, across our developing member countries to the extent, you know, with the usual caveat that uh, data are not always available. They're not always timely. They're not always recorded consistently, but we, we do have a way of doing this. And uh, I, Personally, I'm not familiar with uh, LEED at an urban level. I'd be interested to hear more. Uh, we're always looking for ways to supplement what we do. Uh, let me just look to my fellow panelists to see if they wish to add anything on that. Robert, maybe I can um, talk about this, you know, can sharing of ideas help? And um, of course, I mean, this is precisely the, with the objective we wrote this book. Um, and we have a, a, a de department that we come from, a few of us here, um, uh, which is knowledge department. And with the cross fertilization of ideas with cities and on and how do we create that baseline data to help cities monitor progress. Um, using various tools, a lead, or I think for energy efficiency, many of our cities are already using, maybe Priyanta can add on the uses of that. I have seen it being used quite extensively for energy efficiency, which of course is a very important part of making cities livable. Um, but tracking um, um, progress comes with, really is aided by sharing knowledge. Um, and we see as we as we move towards cross fertilization of ideas um, that that process becomes a lot more efficient uh, and, and we have found that in the cities that twin that partner that really go all out to gather um, how other cities have done uh, have become slightly more resilient if I may even add um, and in in doing um, this uh, this a setting what they want to do, setting the indicators and tracking them. So obviously we see it is plays a very extensive role. Thank you. And not to belabor the point, but if, if I can take just uh, 60 seconds to share my screen, if, if that's okay, it took me a minute to find it, but um, I, oh dear. Sorry, my system settings don't allow it. I, I, I did find the um, operational priority for um, design and monitoring framework. And essentially we have uh, three priorities, which is co coverage, quality, efficiency, and reliability of services improve, urban planning and financial sustainability strengthen, and urban environment, climate resilience, and disaster management improve. And under that, we have uh, three high level indicators and about two dozen lower level indicators that are all, as I said, included in the corporate results framework. It's all on adb.org. Go get it for yourself. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you, Robert. Uh, perhaps we could share that link on our website after the event and once this sure. uh, 
video is uploaded onto our website, it could be available to those who are who are interested in learning more. Um, and, and also, I should add that the uh, publication itself is available to download for free at the moment um, on the ADB website. So um, it's uh, that's definitely something to do as well. Um, we have a few other questions. I'm actually, um, if I may, going to ask one that is uh, quite uh, region specific. It's from Yuan Mei Wang, uh, who would like to know um, about uh, the Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand growth triangles, green city initiative, um, and the sustainable urban development framework and what the panelists actually think about this particular initiative. If anyone has any comments to share about that um, or the endeavors made by either Indonesia, Malaysia or Thailand, um, I think that would be very insightful. Uh, we don't have anybody here from our Southeast Asia Regional Department. Um, let me see if, uh, I don't know, throwing you a, a curveball, Jamie, but you used to be there. Can, can you help us out at all? Probably not, but I think, um, let me try my best. And I think it comes back to what Nita was saying in terms of the question on sharing best practices. When we were, and let me give you one example. When we were um, working with Myanmar when it reopened up, they were very keen to learn from their neighbors. They wanted to know what Thailand, what uh, Malaysia had done at a similar stage in development. So I think these sub-regional groups are a way of countries within the same geographical area, but also at various levels of development. And what the practitioners did, what steps they took, at what point, what policies were put in place, what was the enabling environment? How was the financing done and those components? So I think it, it, in that structure, I, I'm just adding a little bit more on how sharing the information at the local level or geographically local level uh, and learning from peers or those that have just been through the same process. That, that is often what we're hearing from our governments, particularly as in Southeast Asia. I hope that addresses some of the questions, but as you said, um, we don't have one of our uh, Southeast uh, team with us, but that's what, when, when, when I was working there, it was very much that they wanted to know what, what was happening across the border, how did they deal with this, uh, and what lessons can we learn from those. So I think I, that, that's one of the reasons why our sub-regional programs are quite uh, strong in sharing the information, sharing the experiences, and making sure that they're delivered. Thank you. Thank you. I, I Thank you, think... Jamie. And I'll, I'll, I'll just add that um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm dishing this out in bits and pieces, but ADB Strategy 2030 has seven operational priorities, and number seven is regional cooperation and, and integration. And so we have some very strong sub-regional programs, including uh, the Greater Mekong sub-region. We cooperate with them. Iaga and, and others, um, the Growth Triangle, and these are all part of our country strategies. So although I don't think any of us here this evening know the specifics, I can tell you that there are people in ADB who do and who make this their full-time job. Thank you. We've had a couple of questions about uh, financing and um, I, I know that um, Hisaka has given us great detail about um, the financial sustainability challenges, but one of the questions we're getting is about this, uh, the prospect for private uh, public private partnership and if you could you've gave a few examples in your slide uh, but if you and I think one of the companies that was cited was Unilever. Um, We'd, if you could elaborate a little bit more about how this may or may not be gaining steam and where the private sector actually has greater um, interest in working together for it, and that makes actual financial sense, that it actually is profitable for them as well to get in more greatly involved. Uh, th thank you so much. In fact, the public-private partnership is very 
close to my heart. And also after pandemic, there are so many opportunity for private sector to shoulder some task which used to be shouldered by local government and also lo local government are facing financial constraint and also operational constraint. But it's very difficult to say because there, there is no one single magical solution that fit in all. And also cities challenges are very, very different. I mean, some cities um, have old city center which need rehabilitation and also some cities are growing so fast and so, so many outskirt and then a linkage to a city center, old city center and those outskirt are challenging, you know, like a uh, police and then have to engage the private sector. Um, maybe I can highlight the three key issues or three key, um, how can I say, uh, aspect to look into the first size general large size infrastructure uh, can attract uh, well it doesn't have to be infrastructure it can be also series of the asset uh, including the networks uh, those sites uh, well in general larger uh, concession can attract more private sector investor to look at the most challenging area is a small scale rehabilitation. There's no new asset for security. And then those are really difficult to, to finance. But uh, we are trying a new way to make a cluster to combining or aggregating those unbankable projects. And then by making portfolio, we can diversify the risk. I mean, from bankers' point of view, we, we can diversify risk and also connect uh, those cluster with wider range of financials, including institutional investors. Um, well, Unilever and also, you know, uh, some media uh, so-called um, municipal environmental infrastructure is new for private sector participation in Asia. But the other part of the world, such as Central Europe uh, or um, Eastern Europe went through uh, such and then uh, there was a domino effect and one successful project can influence many cities to consider open up sector for private sector participation. And then in terms of water and waste management, um, we started with several countries and then hope to share those lessons learned to other developing member countries in Asia. Uh, sorry, I'm perhaps talking too much. Uh, let, let me stop here, uh, but uh, hope to continue dialogue. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kisaka. Um, another question we are getting um, about um, the issue of, of gender. And I know that Jin Ming in her presentation, she actually went through to that she led with was what was gender. Um, would you be able to elaborate a little bit more about gender and in inclusivity and some of the challenges uh, that we are facing? Um, and what we know, for instance, that women have been particularly hard hit. Uh, we know that, um, that women have greater demands on them than populated urban areas. Um, what are some of the solutions are you looking at not in terms of ameliorating life standards, um, uh, but, but also um, involving their voice, inclusivity in the actual action process and not simply in the implementation process? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. That's uh, really also a very um, good question, very close to my heart. Um, as a woman and also gender and inclusiveness. Uh, yes, uh, uh, in um, all our ADB projects, uh, we are really uh, promoting uh, the, the women's uh, involvement in the whole project, um, not only the design, but also implementation and also the uh, O&M uh, operation and management stage. So it's a whole project cycle involvement of women and, and also um, there are other um, um, minority groups. Um, so step by step, as uh, also my colleagues mentioned, um, there's no universal solution to 
any problem. It's always case by case. So from the project uh, design stage, uh, a lot of consultation, we would really design their uh, age specific and also their uh, gender specific. So we would involve uh, old people, uh, the young people, and also girls, women, and different minority groups to be involved in the consultation stage. Because you know, when we develop the urban infrastructure, water surveys like toilet, it's more related to women. So we would consult them, say where they would prefer to set up this public toilet, and where they prefer to set up even a, a public uh, water supply pole. Their information or their decision, in fact, is very, very important. Otherwise, sometimes if we don't really listen to them, even we set up the public toilet, no woman would come because the location is not good. They are afraid to come. This is so important. Um, and then uh, during the um, implementation stage, we also encourage women to be involved. Uh, specifically, say for this uh, water utilities operation, we would uh, uh, specifically train, train our uh, women technician to do their operation. So later they can be uh, playing a very important role in the long-term uh, operation. In fact, that's also their intention. They can uh, have a good career and they can also help the local families to have water sustainably in a very sustainable way. Um, and also uh, long term, uh, this uh, consultation and involvement and specifically in uh, this pandemic time, uh, a lot of uh, promotion related to WASH you know, wash your hands, keep social distance, all that, yeah? And the wash is uh, the water supply and hygiene. It plays such an important role in this time. And women specifically play a very important role because most of the time they are in charge of uh, families, uh, uh, all these uh, washing things, and also, um, you know, remind their children washing their hand all the time so all this we uh, try to uh, to keep them involved and also we uh, most of the time we work together with the local ngos or some international ngos to promote that so it's a complete um 360 degree involvement not only the ngos but also their um some advanced technologies say we would use of social media because uh, many women really you know including me we always like to you know um talk with our friend or show our pictures in the social media. So the social media would play a very important form to get uh, this gender inclusive uh, involvement. So uh, I just stop here, uh, but that's a very good question. We have a long way to go, but step by step, we are moving forward. Thank you. Shihoku, may I add uh, just something quick? Um, Jingming covered a lot on the projects um, side, how uh, we have really mainstream um, gender um, uh, equality in ADB project, ADB supported projects. Some of the observations I just wanted to quickly share is how cities, the cities that have truly become inclusive are to institutionalize in the planning processes. You know, and, and as, as um, Jingming mentioned, some of the digitalization processes, tools, um, using um, citizens' participation and giving particular emphasis to women's voices there um, have done extremely well. Uh, cities that, that go a little bit extra mile in looking at uh, utility uh, naming, you know, electricity bills, putting it in women's names. And, and Priyanta would probably you know, know of some cases. I know of Fayview where cities went all out. Same with water supply. Um, the, the, the bill of the household, the water bill would go in women's name. And you could see that dynamic, the shift in empowerment when you do that. Um, and cities that launch, you know, build for skills um, in all the programs, targeting women, you know, employment of women 30% and setting that target. Uh, these have been uh, what we see have become very inclusive cities. So some of these processes where you institutionalize um, through measures such as these housing projects, one of the ones Hisaka mentioned in Kolkata, 
the houses that were built were given, the ownership of the houses were given to women by the city. The city made a particular focus to, to ensure that the titles were in the, uh, the woman owner's, household owner's name. So, so and this went, the, the amplification of what this one city did went all over India. So we need some, some of these trendsetters who go little extra miles in institutionalizing these measures and, and, and the, uh, the impacts can be seen quite widely. And we are seeing more of those. Thanks, just wanted to add that. No, that's great. It's almost also um, the bigger picture would also be institutionalizing social change in, in a way as well. Uh, I don't know if Priyanka wants to add um, any comment to that. Oh, okay. Just, just to add one more thing, uh, you know, one example, uh, for instance, uh, we had projects in Nepal and where we decided that uh, you know, when it comes to giving electricity connections to households, uh, uh, you know, energy access, we first gave the priority to uh, women-headed uh, households, for instance. I mean, that's one way to be, uh, to, 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 you know, prioritize them. And uh, when we had transmission lines uh, constructed, we gave priority to, uh, uh, you know, uh, the villages along the transmission lines to be electrified. In those villages, we, we thought that we would give the priority to women at the household first and then move on. So these are some of the areas where we uh, looked at when it comes to gender related inclusiveness. Yes, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I know Uwe is waiting patiently. I know he has a question. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to take the opportunity to ask a question. And uh, the title of the book, of course, is uh, Livable Asian Cities. And when we think of cities, most of us kind of have an image of what a city is. Um, and when we ask a question maybe about a metropolitan area, I think most of us have kind of an image of what a metropolitan area is. Um, one of the things that is really being like radically redefined in, in Asia is the concept of the mega region. Um, which is, you know, globally significant and unprecedented. Um, and of course, we can think of the Greater Bay Area or Yangtze um, Delta. Um, I, I just open question, how does that factor into your thinking uh, in terms of the new set of opportunities available to us uh, to, to, to shape uh, the future of cities in Asia? Let me start with that, if I may. And um, Uwe, that's, that's a really great question and an absolutely fundamental question, not only for um, the bigger countries in the region, like the PRC and India, but increasingly for some of the middle tier countries. Um, there, there's so many dimensions to this. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, I was uh, director for transport in East Asia covering the PRC before moving to my current job. And one of our, one of our biggest efforts was, you know, what, what do we do about city clusters? How do we make them into efficient, effective units of, of governance, of, uh, of development? And when we talk about city clusters in the PRC, if you think about the Beijing, Tianjin, Hebei region, you know, it's, my goodness, it's over 30 million people. It's, it's bigger than most countries by both uh, land area and population size. And yet you can go from central Beijing to the port of Tianjin in under 30 minutes, thanks to the transport links. You know, they're, they're planning the Winter Olympics and you'll be able to go from Beijing to the site by high-speed rail in, you know, under an hour. It's, so number one is, transport links. One of the reasons that's so important is because you have to expand the labor catchment and you have to make sure that people aren't competing for scarce real estate, driving up prices and making housing unaffordable. And one of the things that makes the Beijing region continue to work more or less smoothly is the fact that you can live a long way away and you can still commute to a job that you could never do by private vehicle. So transport's number one. Number two is, and this is a big one, and I, I really encourage a look at the chapter on, on city clusters written by Stefan Rao. Um, cities 
everywhere in the world compete. They compete for population, they compete for businesses because they're incentivized to do so. That's where they get their business license revenue, their tax revenue, uh, all of these things. When you govern at a cluster level, and if you work it out properly, instead of competition, you can actually incentivize cooperation. And so people can live 50, 60, 100 kilometers from the center of a, of a mega region and still be able to, in a micro sense, um, if you think about transit-oriented development, they can get everything done in their neighborhood. They can commute to a job in another part of the cluster. And when they really absolutely have to, they can go to the center or to one of the other nodes. Um, and if you do this properly with revenue sharing, with governance, with land development in a cooperative sense, these things can work efficiently. Now, to be honest, even in the PRC with all its advantages in terms of how, how things can be incentivized, they're still working this out. If you look at uh, other mega regions in, in, in Asia, uh, maybe my colleagues want to jump in and save me from making terrible mistakes here if I keep talking. Uh, most other countries haven't reached that level of sophistication when it comes to cluster governance, but that is clearly the path forward. Let me, let me see if somebody else has something to say on this. Nita. Robert, may I add? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Uwe, yeah, I, I have to agree with um, Robert. You know, if I may also be a little bit of devil's advocate here, the, the good and the bad side of this, um, this clustering and good, of course, Robert has um, uh, highlighted. Um, and we have seen actually in South Asia also, Uwe, um, where the capacity is very low. Uh, for infrastructure development, they have done uh, quite well by having something what you call develop uh, metropolitan development authority, where they cluster, you know, uh, various cities, and and it is a, uh, been a very good way of doing capital development, uh, economies of scale. You cash that, um, you cash these land value captures, you know, you you do uh, the metropol. Uh, 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 any type of infrastructure development, you you cluster water supply, do a bulk supply um, system, you do uh, metro as uh, what we have just seen. We funded that in uh, in NCR in in, in Delhi. So the, this has been uh, ex an extremely good vehicle to do infrastructure development at a very low capacity level where cities cannot manage them. But it does also present um, a, a governance uh, challenge, you know, the revenues in terms of um, taking it forward for keeping that decentralization intact. Um, so these development, met what you call metropolitan development authorities, and you see a lot of them in countries like India, in even Bangladesh, uh, in the region. Um, so then on to when the, the infrastructure is built and handed over, then uptake of that uh, needs careful uh, thinking and in terms of, again, keeping that governance model going, keeping it ticking uh, is, is something that we have not seen um, uh, with, a, with a good balance of really giving that, that um, back to the cities. So maybe I think Jingming also wanted to add here. So I'll just let, let her continue. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Professor Brandy. I think that's a very, very good question. Uh, I just want to add something uh, to what Robert and Nita have said. They have uh, both uh, explained very comprehensively. Uh, this uh, uh, Magrassi city and also the city cluster, in fact, uh, they play such an important role in their uh, existing uh, city uh, statues and also their city planning. And also, in fact, uh, their um, transportation also change their mega cities pattern. Say in, in China, because of this uh, high speed uh, train, um, many people, many the small, many small cities, they are keen to be integrated with uh, very big cities like Guangzhou. 
For example, before people would take maybe one day by car to go to a nearby city, maybe in Hunan province, Changsha, but now they can just spend two hours in train and go to Guangzhou. And Guangzhou provides much better job opportunities, uh, medical situation, medical conditions, so everything. So this transportation, in fact, uh, uh, tends to build even bigger mega cities. So the mega cities and transportation, they are working together with each other. This is the first. Uh, they, they really shape each other way. And then the second, um, mega cities really help the city uh, to develop in a more uh, efficient and also a more livable way. Uh, specifically in Asian, in Asian cities, you can see um, their cities are not growing like a pancake, but more like a pyramid. So the city grows in three dimensions, um, if you see the physical way. And then also, um, if we see the uh, people side, most of the cities now, uh, we, are, we are thinking to help them to de develop this uh, age friendly, not only aging friendly, but friendly with all the age, with uh, young kids, with uh, young people, with uh, middle age, with old people. So the city should be able to accommodate all sorts of people to attract them and then to uh, provide up job opportunities to keep them and then to make them happy. So only uh, mega cities, they would provide better opportunities and better chance to grow because they are huge economy scale as uh, uh, Hisaka said. The scale of everything is the most key to attract the private sector investment. So this is their second um, advantage of their uh, mega cities. They would grow in a pyramid way to be more efficient and to be low carbon and to be more climate friendly. And this would all fit in the future planning of the city. And then the third, this would also put a lot of demand on the governance side, on the financing side, to push us to be more innovative in the governance and more uh, innovative in the financing to involve more private sector involvement, to take more um, advanced uh, technology, like we mentioned this uh, um, big data AI system to help people better say better chasing, uh, you know, if there's any pandemic. So uh, all these mega cities really play a, such a um, magic and uh, fascinating role and we really also put a lot of our effort studying it. And this chapter, as uh, um, Robert mentioned about the city cluster, uh, is really worth reading. It provides a lot of samples how their mega cities are growing and how ADB helped them. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Um, we have about two minutes left. And let me try to get one question in. It's from Blair Rubel um, at the Wilson Center. He asks about, um, how to effectively engage the so-called informal sector in ensuring that um, urban developments move along and what role um, information technologies might play in doing so. And I recall that Jamie actually uh, talked a lot um, and, and pointed out that actually we think about infrastructure, but we should really be putting people first and that technology has a vital role. So perhaps he can uh, talk a little bit about this. Thanks. Sure, I know time is tight, but let me say the, the informal sector from a transport perspective, if we're looking at informal transport or paratransit, it's a vital component of the overall system. There's a lot of discussion about that last mile connectivity in, in North America. A lot of that is already provided, but it's provided by people sitting on the back of a motorbike in a tuk-tuk, in a rickshaw, whatever it may be. And, it, and, it, and, it, and it's, it's huge. It's huge in many dimensions. It's part of a journey, it's one leg of many, but it also employs a very large proportion of the population. The World Bank estimated in Dhaka, Bangladesh, that around 30% of households got income from the transport sector. And that was primarily from the rickshaws. So that informal sector or that informal part of the transport system, it provides the access at the very local level, that distribution, the, the, the third tier, but it also is a huge employment. And, and in many transport systems, uh, the informal sector plays a significant role. Um, there are tens of thousands of owner operators of these vehicles. So it's the economics, it's the accessibility. So we're pushing that this should be seen as an integral part 
of the system, it should not be replaced, it should be strengthened. And when you mention that digital technology, how can we ensure it's operating more efficiently? It's both for the passengers and for the, for the operators themselves. So bringing in uh, that technical innovation, information sharing at both ends. And so it, it is critical and it certainly should not be removed. It should be encouraged. It should be uh, strengthened where possible. And I think that that is possible through the, the digitization and information sharing. Thank you. No, thank, thank you. And we've covered a lot of ground today. Um, I know that we've only uh, touched the tip of the iceberg. Um, but I'm so grateful that you were able to join us um, to share um, some of the highlights of your recent publication, Creating Livable Asian Cities. Again, that's available on the ADB website. Um, before we uh, call it a day for today, it's very late in Manila, um, I would like to thank my colleagues here at the Wilson Center, um, Alison Garland with the uh, Urban Sustainability Lab in particular, but also uh, the AV team, um, Tracy Fitzgerald, John Tyler, who really make these events happen. So with that, um, thank you all very much for joining us today and hopefully we'll see you again soon. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very Thank much, Shihoko and colleagues.